Good morning. I'm Robin Cohen from the University of Southern California School of Medicine. And this is an STS roundtable concerning the surgical challenges associated with infectious endocarditis. I'm humbled to be surrounded by some of the world's authorities in aortic surgery and endocarditis, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Scott Goldman. I'm from uh, Philadelphia at the Lankadale Heart Institute. Hi, I'm Eric Roselli from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Joe Bavaria from the University of Pennsylvania. So, endocarditis poses, uh, to me, one of the most challenging issues that we're faced with in cardiac surgery. Uh, there are complex decisions uh, regarding when to operate. Sometimes you never know what you're going to find when you get into the operating room. These operations require reconstructions that are awful and complex, um, and they're in the sickest patients. So, you know, Scott, uh, one question I have is, when should a surgeon be involved in a patient with endocarditis? Sometimes I'm amazed at how late we are in the process or somehow despite AATS criteria and guidelines that we're familiar with, maybe that's not the pathway that the patient's on. Yeah, so uh, you know, my feeling is surgeons should be involved extremely early. Um, I mean, I think the consult should go in for ID and surgery at the same time. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of data that the earlier we operate, the better the outcomes. And uh, uh, it's very frustrating sometimes when you get a, a very late consult after a lot of damage is done or the patient's very sick. So, um, you know, I believe uh, uh, absolutely surgeons should be involved right at the onset. So no, no patient should leave the hospital with a diagnosis of endocarditis without a surgical consult, Joe? Agree completely. Um, you know, most the data as Scott was just talking about, uh, does lean more towards earlier surgery, which then would, of course, mean earlier consult. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everybody gets operated on. There are uh, sub subgroups that, uh, that don't get operated on. But the interesting thing about some of those groups is that if we don't know about them, they may go home, and then the, if they come back for, uh, for an operation later on because of valvular failure, which is pretty significant, they may, so a lot of times they'll come in too late. Mm -hmm. um, so. So the surgeons need to be involved for both reasons very early. Yeah, I think it's important to think about uh, with endocarditis patients uh, applying the sort of the same trend that we've applied to many patients with complex cardiovascular disease. That is, create a team around these patients. So the surgeons need to be involved early, just like infectious disease uh, physicians. But you also have to have members from other disciplines on your team, including psychiatrists. Uh, and, and an entire team of specialists that can manage these patients, uh, pulmonologists, nephrologists, everyone needs to understand the, the nuances of this disease process because it goes on even after they leave the hospital, even after you operate on them. Thanks. The echocardiographers are around. Imagers, imagers are key. Absolutely. Too. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So given that, um, you become the leader of that team because you get to decide when the patient's going to be operated on. And there's sort of a, some controversy about that. You operate on them right away. Should uh, their blood cultures be negative? Should they have a week of antibiotics to, quote, get the infection under control? In a patient who is relatively stabilized, let's say their heart failure is under control, um, they, their blood cultures are okay, when do you go? I think um, once we have the indication to operate on the patient, it's important to get them on the schedule and get them taken care of. So no week of antibiotics to, quote, really clear the infection? Well, I think you want them, you want to, if you can identify the bug and you can get them treated with antibiotics, it makes sense to certainly uh, have them get, a, you know, get treated. You don't have to take them the night they arrive unless mm -hmm. they're, they're crashing on you. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think, we, you know, we like to try and get that patient treated within that week, you know, within that first week of arrival. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think there is a subgroup, uh, uh, particularly like, uh, like mitral valve prolapse patients that may develop endocarditis without really any change in their valvular disease. Uh, they have an easily treatable, you know, strep bug. And I think those are the types of patients that if they sterilize very quickly, you know, they can be managed more electively. But I think, uh, you know, other organisms like, you know, staff organisms or people who have complicated endocarditis, they've already had emboli. Uh, um, you know, they, they remain in heart failure. I think that they should be operated much earlier. Yeah, I think the big, the big, big sea change um, as a result of a few pet publications was this concept of, of sterilization, you know, of, of true sterilization. So 
I think it gets into the to what Eric was talking about with if you have an indication for surgery, okay, if you have a classic indication for surgery, in in the past it was okay you have an indication for surgery but they're kind of pseudo stable and, and not crashing, so then you would you would wait until a cleared blood a blood culture that was ne that was truly negative mm -hmm. and, and that can take a while. Right. So that's where the where things have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're like uh, Eric, which is, as soon as you have an indication for surgery, we'll put antibiotics on for 24 or 40 hours. We're not waiting for a, a negative blood culture necessarily. Most of the time they'll, they'll be negative uh, by that time after, after the antibiotics, but you don't want to wait three, three to five days for the, for the no. pathology, I mean, for the, uh, the lab to come back with an, with an actual negative culture. I mean, I think if you have the luxury of figuring out what the organism is and what antibiotics it's, sensitive to, you know, I think it's very helpful to have that information, you know, at the time you take them to surgery, but, you know, sometimes we don't get that, but if they're really sick, but I think in general, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. And I think the other thing about it is, is, is it's, um, especially in the mitral position, but also in the, to a lesser extent in the aortic position, um, the earlier surgery, you can do a little bit more, you know, you can repair these valves a little right. bit more than you could before, um, and you can never repair a valve if, it's, if you're way too late. Yeah, well, I think um, a key differentiation is here is to understand that the native valve endocarditis and prosthetic valve endocarditis patients Great are point. very different, right? Yes. The prosthetic valve endocarditis patient has an indication for surgery. That's not going to get better with antibiotics. And, and unfortunately, I see there's some confusion sometimes with that, you know, optimizing antibiotic therapy. We see patients who are treated too long with antibiotics with prosthetic valve endocarditis, and then they come in really bad destructive problems. Um, so I think, you know, with the native valve endocarditis, maybe you can wait a little longer and see how the antibiotic therapy is going to treat their problem. And with the prosthetic valve endocarditis, I would say don't waste too much time. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think waiting on a prosthetic valve endocarditis is almost punitive. Yeah, okay. As the later you go, the more, the more well, difficult the situation you're going to come in. So let's get to the operation for, for some of these patients. You know, if I go to the literature, I could actually build a pretty good case that you can cure a lot of valvular endocarditis with a prosthetic valve, either biologic or mechanical. Um, having said that, so many people believe that homographs are the place to be. Um, there are a lot of hospitals in the United States that don't have a homograph freezer. There are a lot of surgeons that don't put a lot of homographs in, don't do a lot of roots for that matter. Um, what's your philosophy about when a homograph root reconstruction is necessary in aortic endocarditis? And does that mean that all of those patients should be transferred to referral centers who have expertise, Joe? Well, you know, I, I, we've, wrote, we've written a number of big papers on this, and in fact, we got into a big argument with Cleveland Clinic on this. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, um, I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, a straightforward endocarditis case uh, without annular destruction, uh, for the aortic valve anyway, um, can be done with any um, valve. And if you have a negative blood culture, that's only a three, three to four percent recurrence rate. So you're right, most of them are going to be cured. So it's now, does that include the small abscess that you can easily patch with a little piece of pericardium? Yeah, okay. probably. Um, the, uh, um, anything more destructive than that, or any, uh, a lot of times uh, 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 prosthetic valve endocarditis will require a root procedure. And where, I suppose where there may be some, a little bit of disagreement, but it's, I don't think it's that much, is we tend to use a lot of homographs. Um, but our data would suggest that from an infectious standpoint and a, a mortality standpoint, there's no difference. And, and from a re late recurrence standpoint, there's no difference between a root procedure that's a mechanical composite graft, a bio root, or a homograft. That's our data, and I think the Mayo data is the same. So um, let me just stop I, you there okay. because everybody here is thinking, wait a minute, you're going to put in a prosthetic valve with a Dacron conduit into an infected field, and that can be as good as a homograph? Well, the data, the data would say that, that, that for those three endpoints I just said, there's no difference. However, we use homographs um, a lot. Uh, we have a freezer, obviously, and we get a lot of, of uh, referrals from cardiac surgical centers in our region who don't have homograph banks. Uh, for these destructive prosthetic valve endocarditis cases. And the reason why I like homographs is technical. 
Um, it's just such a beautiful technical procedure uh, in, a, in a destroyed route. You can sew mitral to mitral, you can sew um, uh, outflow tract to outflow tract, uh, and uh, if the annulus is gone, you know, it's gone, and it's just a nice, it's a nice operation, and it's very, very, you know, successful in our hands. But it's, it's not, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it's because the, re, the end results are, that, are better from recurrent endocarditis or any of those, uh, survival or any of those sorts of things. Yeah, so if I could comment about homographs a bit. Um, all due respect, Joe, in the mortality in your series where you compared to three different root replacements was over 20%. So, um, and, and in our series of patients with homograft usage, the mortality has been less than 5%. So maybe we're talking about different populations of patients. But I agree with your comments about the real benefits of homograft is in the patient with really invasive disease, the prosthetic valve endocarditis patients especially. Mm -hmm. And I think the principle of the surgical technique is not so much about what valve you choose. You choose whatever you know, you're most comfortable with in the reconstruction. It's what happens before you reconstruct everything. Radical debridement is key. We've got to really be radical in the debridement. If you got more invasive disease, you do more radical debridement. It sure is nice to have a homograph to reconstruct everything with, as, as you said, Joe. I totally agree with you. Yeah. I completely agree. So, I, I mean, I use homographs almost exclusively for prosthetic valve endocarditis or native valve endocarditis, especially when it's leaflet disease. I think they just, just do fine with whatever you put in there, you know, whatever is appropriate for the patient. But I think uh, really for technical reasons, when you have a, when you have a big root abscess and uh, you have, you know, a lot of tissue you have to debris, I mean, the homograph just gives you a lot of, it just gives you a lot of, uh, uh, options for how to reconstruct the patient so so who are not candidates for surgery in the presence of endocarditis 88 year old woman um, fragile mitral endocarditis on a on a on a ring that you can see on the x-ray is all calcified little demented in the ICU and the infectious disease specialist is saying surgery is her only chance. The family is saying, why not operate on her if surgery is her only chance? When do you turn a patient down for surgery in the, in the face of endocarditis? Well, in, in Pennsylvania, we have a luxury that, uh, you know, we have a database for cardiac surgery uh, and endocarditis is an exclusion, so you can pretty much you can pretty much operate anybody, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, that being said, you know I think I think you look at patients like you know would they be a, would they be a candidate for surgery if they just had you know severe mitral valve regurgitation in, in that in that state and if they wouldn't be you know if they wouldn't be a, a candidate for surgery if it wasn't endocarditis for mitral valve disease I don't think the endocarditis makes them an, gives them an indication. Excellent point. I think yeah. that's a great way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. And the lady you totally described great. sounds like someone I wouldn't be too excited about taking to the ocean. Yeah. Mm, I agree. Yeah. Um, what about uh, endocarditis in drug abusers? What, is, what are the policies in your group, in your hospital? Um, what kind of valves do you put in? Who do you operate on? So um, we've looked at those patients pretty closely. It represents, of course, a growing number of patients, uh, especially in, in our state where we see the opioid epidemic has been, um, uh, you know, has affected patients more, as much as anywhere. Um, and, I, and I would revert back to your description. If the patient has an indication for surgery, we operate on them. If they're an IV drug abuser and they have addiction disease, we also treat their addiction disease. Now, we understand that those patients do absorb a lot of resources and there are issues about that, but I don't think that that's our decision to make when we're the surgeon. You know, we have to treat the disease we face. What we've learned when we looked at our IV drug abuse population is within the first three months, the risk of death or reoperation was no different than non-drug users. But in that period between 90 and 180 days, between three and six months, the, uh, the hazard ratio for death or reoperation was 10 times the non-drug abuse. Mm -hmm. They come back. And a lot of times it's because it's really hard to treat their addiction disease. Um, but after that six month period, if we can get them through that, they actually, their survival curves go right back to the same sort of risk as we see with other endocarditis patients. Mm 
So I think we manage their disease, their disease is the best we can, and, and all the more important to kind of have a multidisciplinary team involved in their care. So Joe, you do all of those things. Um, two years later, uh, one of these patients falls off the wagon and comes back with recurrent aortic endocarditis in the prosthesis you previously placed. How many times, how many strikes do they get? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's usually because they've um, gone back to the, to the IV drug abuse. And uh, uh, I agree with Eric that you, know, you have to, especially in that early phase, you have to treat them. Uh, not just their, you, know, you have to treat, them, treat their disease process regarding their drugs, drug abuse. I mean, that's like huge, it's, cri it's critical. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we've seen, all of us have seen this a lot. And I, I, I'm just, I'll just be honest, it's a very, uh, this is a very a deeply ethical uh, decision that's almost personal. Um, we do not have a policy uh, on this because we can't develop one because each of the different surgeons in our group uh, actually have a different uh, a viewpoint on, on this. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that half the surgeons in our group would not operate on uh, an IV drug abuser who comes back and has, um, after a long and intensive uh, operative, uh, uh, you know, endeavor as well as a, uh, a treatment endeavor for their for their disease, um, they would not operate on. But the other half would give them a second chance. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have a good answer for you there. Uh, and sometimes when we're when we have an ethical, uh, you know, situation like this, uh, there is no uh, right or wrong. There's. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I think you have to look at, you know, it's, it's really part of the addic addiction disease, you know, and I think that if you're treating somebody with addiction disease, you have to be prepared to understand that they're gonna, there's going to be recidivism in that disease. Mm -hmm. So if you take those patients on, I think, you know, I think that the fact that they've had recidivism and they have another problem, I think you, I think you should treat them, you know, as long as it's not a ridiculous procedure that you're dealing with, I mean, you know, if, if it's not a procedure, they're not going to survive anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, I think you just have to be prepared. Now, if they, if they have, if, they, if it keeps coming back and back and back and it gets very complicated, you know, I then it's a decision you have to make. I have data on this. Yeah. But my personal experience, and this, and this is where a lot of our personal experiences come, I have never seen anybody be a long, midterm survivor who's come back with a reinfected drug abuse valve in my life. So maybe you guys have, but. Uh. Well, let's just end on that optimistic <laughs> note. So uh, this has been an STS Roundtable. Thank you guys very much.